Hello and welcome to the panel for CNCF today. We are, well, we are an interesting bunch over here to talk to you about serverless and everything serverless security. For To start off with, we're going to do a basic introduction. I'll just start with my introduction. I'd love to have a few words from each one of the members over here on the panel. My name is Ashish. I am the host of Cloud Security Podcast. I'm a CISO on my 9 to 5 and run a live stream on cloud security and cloud native security over the weekend. That's my short intro. Over to you, Andrew, for your quick introduction. I'm Andrew Krug. I'm a technical evangelist at Datadog. Done a lot of work on serverless stuff in the past. Uh, that's my short intro. I'll go ahead and hand it over to Ariel. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm Ariel. Uh, I'm a cloud security evangelist in Cisco uh, in the Emerging Technologies and Innovation team. Uh, it's a new team that Cisco set up to tackle cloud technologies and security, among others. And I it over to uh, Roger. Thank you, Ariel. I'm Ragashree, and I'm a cloud security specialist at Nokia, handling uh, the cloud security for one of the largest private clouds called Nokia Enterprises Services Cloud. Happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. So I'm going to kick it off because considering we have a 40 minute panel, uh, I want to start with the basic for a lot of people may not even know who we are, what do we do. So maybe the first question to ask is what is STAG in the CNCF and how does anyone become part of it? Andrew, do you want to just kick it off, man? Yeah, so the, the TAG group or the Security Technology Advisory Group is a, a group of folks who facilitate and collaborate on uh, a variety of security topics across CNCF, right? So um, they do, do everything from architecture patterns, prescriptive guidance to white papers, uh, like the, the one that uh, we're going to talk about a little later on in the panel. Um, but basically, this is just an open group that really anyone can be a part of. And I think that's one of the really cool things about all things CNCF, but also the STAG is that it's it's really open to everybody. So you don't have to be a security expert to show up and make a meaningful contribution. And is that only for serverless security or can people join any security project? People can join any security project and there's, there's a variety of uh, security products going on. Everything from like serverless to software building materials projects to things like um, uh, gatekeeper for Kubernetes, like all that, lots, lots and lots of great work. So um, I encourage anybody who was interested in this panel, you're probably the target demographic for the stack, right? Cool. Uh, well, I guess the, it's, there's no surprise that serverless security one is the coolest panel. That's why we're all here. So <laughs> we should definitely encourage people to join the serverless security one. Uh, talking about serverless security, uh, maybe a good question to ask next, or maybe if this is for you, Ariel. Why was there a need for a serverless security white paper? Because isn't there like already a serverless white paper in CNCF? Right. So there is a serverless white paper, and I think there was a great work which was done, you know, a few years ago to try to highlight what is the threat landscape. Uh, but you know, like everything in security, things are changing. You know, serverless is changing. There are more services. There are more uh, attack options, more risks which are being discovered. And I think it was a good time uh, to refresh that previous work to take a more broader look both what the risk which exist or what new uh, you know, risk vectors uh, can serverless application face. On the other side, also to look at what are solutions, what things, what things were improved, and there's a tremendous progress uh, in the different cloud uh, providers which was made that made uh, this new area uh, require some refreshment. And that was, I think, part of the purposes uh, behind this white paper. So is it... Quite, I mean, I, I would have thought a lot of the security is usually covered already. So what are some of the um, interesting threats you may have come across for serverless that kind of, I mean, makes it different and maybe drive the required requirement for a separate white paper? Like so, a attack vector or threats perspective, sorry. Right. So, you know, I think there in, in, in serverless, there are general, there are, you know, different attack vectors, you know, the, uh, the, Threats coming, you know, from different space. Let me let me just kind of in, try to forget the buzzwords and talk about some some details. Um, the serverless functions are really tightly coupled with different cloud services, and uh, the way to see, you know, the full, uh, I would say, the full, um, uh, I would say, the way you can visualize your entire uh, environment or the permissions that you grant to your environment and. And different configurations that you do on different cloud services uh, has a significant impact on 
uh, the actual risk of the serverless function. So I think in the beginning, there was the motivation to try and to draft uh, what would be the risk model, what would be the different threats. Now, we can see more and more services which are being used today together with serverless functions. We can see, you know, uh, even new type of things that are going to be addressed, like, you know, software bill of material, like uh, getting a better understanding of the different supply chain uh, area of the different software packages uh, in your serverless function. So even if they are a small piece of code, uh, they still contain uh, different packages or different, you know, they use different services uh, that create a different risk on your uh, application. So I think all of it together it nailed down to a need to both address uh, the serverless security from, you know, an updated angle. Did I answer your question, Ashish? Yeah, you did. I kind of answered it. Were there any specific examples that you wanted to call out for attack vectors for serverless? So I think, you know, um, we can, we can just take a look and I think you know, we can discuss it more in length, you know, later in, you know, in our panel about uh, the new exposure of HTTPS, uh, HTTP endpoint without passing through the API gateway uh, to make it, you know, simpler and easy to, to, to use those endpoints. But eventually, you know, you, you overlook, I mean, it's very easy and, and I understand the motivation why, you know, uh, for example, in AWS, they released this functionality, but bypassing you know api gateway or bypassing you know load balancers um it avoids a lot of the security uh you know a lot of the security mechanisms which are built into it you know to validate and to verify and to authenticate and authorize uh the request which again for, as example give put the serverless function which is being invoked uh in a different risk so maybe this is like something specific to a new service that try to to AWS. but usually you know when people ask me about it uh, and before going diving into like a specific attack which were crafted for serverless, uh, I'm always trying to give an example. Like, look at the look at the, like you know the, the the permissions, the fact that every function require a different set of permissions. You know, will by default in especially in large scale environment uh, reach the situation that you have uh, you know permissions which are not clearly designed or tailored for this function, and you're going to find yourself in uh, granting application a lot of uh, permissions to do or you know, a lot of resources and to do many things on things which you're not supposed to or not in, you know or at least didn't plan to and the result is that if a function is breached the, the, the you know the impact which you know is, is much larger now when you look at for example you know what uh, all you know the different uh, the functions and you know the different services or the buses you know that they are connected to uh, and again under the assumption that you want them to run free, you want them to run in a very smooth way, you want to avoid performance, you know, uh, degradations, the ability to secure them is, of course, you know, much lower or much less. And this is why you need to be much more sensitive to maybe aspect that you are less sensitive in more stateful applications. Sweet. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Andrew, did you want to follow up on that as well? Yeah, I think the bottom line here, when we think about the attacks and, and threats for serverless is really to, to spin that and think about how the attack surface is increasing, right? So when I first started to look at this stuff in, in 2017, AWS Lambda, for example, was pretty new. And, and you know, there's like a couple of patterns for, for getting events in and doing invocations. And now if you think about it, you really have to kind of think about serverless security in, in like three different fronts. You have the, the runtime itself, you have the network perimeter and you have identity, right? And maybe that identity now is multi-cloud. So uh, it's just more and more complicated. And as different runtimes bolt on more functionality to extend the capability of the runtime, like we have layers now and you can even bring your own Docker container that suddenly can be run as a serverless function. The more diversity that we get in those environments, they become more and more challenging to defend, right? Because that was always the sales pitch before is you have this shared responsibility model, and then you have this very, very small thing that, that you can laser focus on. And as that small thing becomes big, you know, we're, we're increasingly challenged. That's all, that's all. Uh, do you agree with that, Ariel? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I definitely you know, just wanted one, you know, small, and Andrew said, you know, the, the attack vector is increases, but I'm looking at it from the defender side the ability to defend without, you know, creating, you know, friction or degradation or 
you know, imposing some, you know, external binaries into your functions is really small. This is why, you know, you need to be super careful in how do you configure the monitor. Yeah, actually uh, true. I, I was going to add, add a few more uh, solid examples as well. I think to what you said, Ariel, as well about the API space. I think it's definitely interesting because, um, and I think maybe this is a combination of what Andrew and both you said as well, with the APIs being, I guess, the trigger for starting off a, an event or a serverless event, not having control over the API that can send a request to Andrew's point. It could be multi-cloud, it could be an IoT device, and plus the fact that now there is no workload protection or there's no antivirus that you can actually deploy on a serverless machine. The the I guess the, mon the monitoring aspect of it is like, what are you really looking for in a real-time context? Is there's a lot more complex, and I don't know how many people actually out there are thinking about, hey, we want to deploy serverless, but then I don't have to work like to go to Andrew again, share responsibility. How much is mine? How much is uh, the AWS or an Azure or a Google Cloud responsibility? I think that's definitely another interesting aspect that kind of came out. I think the thread that makes me always uh, cringe is the, the the denial of wallet attack that people talk about, where because you don't really control the number of server and serverless instances that can be created, you could basically keep sending a request and it just keeps adding more Lambda functions until we end up with a fat bill in the end. I think that's definitely was my favorite one that I was reading all about it. So at least that's, uh, are there any attacks that you guys have found to be fascinating for yourself in the serverless space? I don't know, Andrew, do you wanna go first? I mean, there's there's a variety, right? And I think that there's been a lot of attention lately on the uh, crypto miners that have popped up. Um, oh yeah, that are are purpose built for Lambda functions. So this is kind of a, a interesting time, right? Because we we have this thing now that is popular enough that people are making bespoke malware. But that's really not the attack vector. That's the the post exploitation, you know, sort of mechanism that the attacker is using. I think the most important thing to, to realize is that attack vectors for serverless are really just attack vectors. Like there's, they're the same ones that are prevalent in our OWASP top 10 model. It's just that uh, from a forensics perspective, because the environment gets thrown away at the end, it can be really, really difficult to reverse what happened. So if you think about something like deserialization vulnerabilities, um, really, really basic, right? Uh, but the evidence that's left behind is only as good as the login. Yeah, yeah, right. that's very, very fine. Do you have one as well, Ariel? Yeah, I want to know what, you know, Andrew was saying. It's really an important point, you know, how do you inspect them? Because in containers, for example, if you run crypto miner campaign in your environment, it's easy to see the new amount of containers and new services. Say, hey, I'm not familiar with it. But in functions, you know, which are ephemeral, so they execute and, they say, and, and you only can see afterwards, you know, how much time or how many executions where and you try to think to break it much harder to detect this type of uh, campaigns or this type of uh, attacks. So as Andrew said, you know, the, the attacks could be the same, but you know, the detection is much harder. Yeah, I think maybe it's a good segue into what's probably a good practice to have for ma ma okay, managing or certainly starting off doing serverless security. I think some of the initial points that come to mind is to have a control over your identity which again, we've called out already, uh, maybe having some kind of a rollback, role-based access control for how much, because I think the number of Lambda functions you see with admin roles in AWS, and I'm sure the, the versions of this do exist in Azure and Google Cloud as well. Uh, the whole supply chain security has definitely become quite common as well. They have a CI CD pipeline that can at the end trigger a Lambda or some other kind of a serverless function. But is anyone doing a validation whether it's authenticated or if it's restricted to a certain function as well? Uh, I think the one uh, theme that I've taken away from what both you have, uh, Ariel and Andrew have said, is the the, in, the detection part. And I know I think uh, uh, Andrew, you had some thoughts on the whole logging aspect of this as well in the serverless space. What what do people do for logging? Because it sounds like I mean I can build the most secure serverless function with identities covered. I've got I don't know my code is really secure. I've got SAS Dask running on it. SCA my libraries are cleared, but it would be pointless, as Ariel said, if there is no detection. So what are some thoughts on logging in this serverless world? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really interesting kind of right now what we're seeing evolve in the serverless space, which is that observability that we used to use for performance monitoring um, and, and just generally determining if the system is healthy has become the, the very same facilities that we need to do security. 
right? And in, in some ways, our need to use those same logs for security has enhanced the, the way that we're doing logging, right? So simple things like the idea of having a, a set of standard attributes or structured log that you're implementing in code itself, really, really critical. And then things like on the cloud provider control plane side, ensuring that you're following some kind of unified tagging standard so that you know which pieces of an application are associated with providing what service. So when those attacks do come in and you do have a facility for detecting that the, the attack has come into the service serverless environment, you can immediately sort of create this graph. And when I say graph, I mean like graph like Bloodhound makes, like graph theory oh, yeah. that of the potential path of the attacker through the system, not, not just like a, like a dashboard graph, but always be thinking in that sort of uh, what, what are the services that are associated with it? What is the identity? And then what are the potential lateral moves from, from inside of that initial attack, right? Oh, something like a MITRE attack framework. A little bit, yeah. Okay, that would be, so to your point, I mean, I guess because what Ariel mentioned was quite interesting because if it doesn't exist, are there any specific things we're looking for logging then? Like, I think, are there, are there from a security perspective, what do you recommend? Uh, how does this help it? So I think it's important to divide uh, divide this up into like kind of two efforts, right? It's like one, effort number one is like, how do you make the logs so that they're readable by machines and by humans, right? Yep. Uh, you'll hear people say like, oh, JSON, just JSONify all your logs and you're, you're kind of done. Definitely not JSON. Uh, or even YAML for that matter as well, oh yeah. my God. <laughs> JSON is not super, super human readable. So when, when I sit down and I make a brand new serverless app today, you know, I'm really thinking in like key value, kind of like parsable single log lines that contain a set of standard attributes that then I can really easily use in a detection platform or something and maybe standardize those or, or remap them to the same ones I use for the cloud provider's control plane. So all of a sudden we're able to do correlation between events in something like AWS CloudTrail and what's happening inside of the application itself. So sort of just thinking about what are the pieces of data for my business, you know, my use case and serverless that I wanna to bring together to perform uh, detections on the application itself. Oh, so you're saying we can correlate, I guess, provided functions by your whoever your service provider for serverless is and the application logs to kind of hopefully some, combine some kind of detection. Is that is that right? Is that how you're thinking about this? Yeah. So if you if you really think about it, what what you want is you want this entire chain of custody of of attribution from the invocation of the function to the time that that function exits, right? And and depending on the method by which you're you're invoking the runtime that runs the code, that, that could be a bunch of different ways, right? So if it comes in through API gateway, that's an event whose identity is API gateway. If it's a user calling invoke function, that's different. If it's a CloudWatch event uh, on EventBridge, that's a different story too. So being able to attribute those back to, how did this thing even get started? And then knowing what happened inside of it and knowing what happened afterwards potentially if somebody got an identity out that's telling yeah. a cool story yeah and i guess to your point if you can trace it back to what was the change in the function code itself maybe that could be one uh, one more data point into that whole flow if there's a data point change or if there's a change to the function who made the change and how did that travel across to production or wherever cool uh, anything to add to this ariel or you good i think you're good no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, perfect. Cool. So, because I, I think I was going to say maybe it's a, also a good segue into, because I, I guess what we are also trying to cover is some of the interesting topics that came out of the whole serverless security white paper you wrote. So, I'll definitely encourage people to kind of check it out when we release it. But um, one thing that we were looking also was into the whole evolution and what does the future of serverless look like? Obviously, everyone who's listening to the panel has obviously heard about the different kind of threats that exist. They've also heard about how do you log it properly. So if there is an, a change or there is a threat that needs to be picked up, there is, uh, to Andrew's point, there's an end-to-end -end attack path that you can come up with, maybe similar to attack MITRE. Maybe attack MITRE may come up with a framework for this as well. But uh, one of the things that came up with the future thing was the, the whole aspect of abstraction as we kind of keep going into more layers of, I don't need to care about in my infrastructure anymore. So that means I don't need to care about patching. I don't want to care about my workload protection. I don't want to care about antivirus. 
Then if I go into CI CD pipeline, well, as long as my function probably covers the whole basic application security functions, like your uh, SCAs for uh, vulnerable libraries or static code analysis, that code that is being maintained or code that is being pushed into as a function or into a serverless function is clean from a security perspective, has probably low, only lows, hopefully. Like those kind of things are going to be the only things people would focus on and maybe identity as the other one. Because I think as long as the the orchestration and creation and generation is taken care of by quote unquote shared responsibility by your serverless provider, I think that, that kind of cares, takes care of what a future in this kind of world can look like. There's a lot more abstraction, but uh, that's kind of what we want to have the future for. But I, I'm pretty sure as all of us are hinting towards white paper, we kind of probably should go into what went through into doing the whole white paper. So maybe Raga, you could just probably give us an intro into the whole, what was the process undertaken for the white paper since you were quite involved as well? Could you shed some light on that for everyone listening? Sure. sure. So the basic process itself, uh, as already stated in this call, there was already a serverless white paper available. So uh, the first step for us is to identify what are the gaps that was in the white paper and how could we fill it from the security perspective itself so majority of the threats some of the myths we had to burst and some of the best practices we can share with the community to enlighten and support in the uh, complete end-to-end -end life cycle of their securing the serverless itself so with this uh, the first step itself was to jot down all the aspects we wanted to cover in the white paper and second is to trigger one issue in our uh, stag github so with this, uh, we got a lot of interest from the community. We assigned some of the project leaders and rolled out the plan. And we had consistent meetings across a couple of um, weeks. We synced up, I think, once in a week and uh, aligned with all of us, took the projects, and uh, we worked on our content individually, got the feedback, and uh, released the first set of version for the internal reviews as well. And once we thought we are in good shape and we are okay to go ahead for a wider audience review, the paper was released for the complete secure stag security team's mailing list. And it is now in the review phase of the, uh, the community as well. So we are here and it would help us greatly if you can chime in, add your inputs and help us make this white paper even better. Sweet. I, and I, I can definitely watch for there are definitely interesting conversations during the whole, whether something is relevant for the white paper, who's the audience, what's the context for it as well. So people who may be thinking about, hey, I want to contribute because I've heard this four awesome people on a panel and I want to, I don't know, is there a mailing list or something or the other that people can subscribe to? Absolutely. How do they become part of this? Absolutely. Stag's GitHub, uh, I think Andrew has already pasted on the chat. So Stag's GitHub, you can subscribe to this repository. There is a mailing list right in the Stag's repo. Please subscribe to the mailing list. You will get all the content up to date with whatever we are publishing. There are several lots of projects available, right from the policy, SBOMs, and uh, serverless here. And we also have an interesting topic of lexicon. So whatever you want to contribute, uh, you can just pull up an issue and uh, get the attention of our uh, chairs and we're here to help you. And we have a wonderful support system uh, in terms of mentorship or anything you need to get started. Or if you're a seasoned professional, we're seeking your inputs always. So feel free to get in touch with us. We have our, our Stag security uh, Slack as well. So feel free to DM us and we're happy to help. Sounds good. And uh, although, as I said earlier, serverless security probably is the coolest group in the, in the batch, but there are definitely a lot more projects in there. Uh, got more ready if you want to work on SBOM, but software bill of material <laughs> because it was a presidential order, but you can totally do that as well. There's a, a interesting group for that as well. Uh, but that's pretty much what we had time for here. And any last comments from anyone before we kind of close? Because I think we have an interesting bunch over here. And I think if anyone has any questions, as Raga mentioned, feel free to DM us on our Slack or just head to the GitHub security, uh, tag security GitHub. And uh, I've opened up an issue or just message on to the Slack channels that is relevant for the project that you want to get involved in. But that's pretty much what we had time for. Thank you, everyone, for joining the panel. If you have questions, as always, reach us on our favorite Slack and GitHub channels. Otherwise, we'll talk to you soon on the next panel, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.